Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lucina Russell, and I'm one of the festival organisers um, for the Kildare Readers Festival. We're a very small but very dedicated uh, committee, and delighted that you could join us here for the launch event of the Kildare Readers Festival 2018. Um, and I hope you noticed our attention to detail with the fanfare that we organised just a few moments ago. It took so long to organise those trucks, you wouldn't believe it. Um, but unfortunately, there was health and safety issues with Des arriving in at the back of the stage on a truck, so we had to go without that. So. Uh, but so, uh, thank you for bearing with us when we had that delay. We just wanted to make sure that everybody was in the audience bef before we, auditorium before we started. I'd like to extend a special wel welcome to Deputy Fiona O'Loughlin, who joined us this evening, and to Deputy Mayor Robert Power, who's here, uh, to the man of the moment, I suppose, Des Egan and his family, to the Philoir Trio. I had the pleasure of listening to them rehearse earlier on, and I think I'm very much looking forward to listening to, listening to them, but also to watching them play. And I think it's a real joy to be able to watch live music. And I think jazz is one of those that there's lots of things going on. And I'd also like to welcome uh, Lorcan, Lorcan Cranage, and Lorcan is here. He's going to uh, do some readings for us tonight. Uh, and just to say that Des will be available for some signings and for conversation later on. Um, I want to, there's one person I really want to mention tonight, um, and that is Neil Donnelly. Neil came to me quite some time ago about this event, and when he phones and says, there's something I think you should do, uh, and that, that happens fairly regularly with Neil. Um, he, he did that with um, another project around Aidan Higgins, and I'd say Neil is quite a selfless person, and usually the projects he talks to me about are about celebrating somebody else. I mentioned Aidan Higgins, and tonight um, this is an event um, very much about Des Egan and his work, but uh, a huge amount of work has uh, taken place very quietly in the last few months uh, by Neil. And I did think, Neil, given your own reputation as a writer, um, I was thinking something like a surprise birthday party type event where we actually acknowledge your work. I'd say you'd love something like that, Neil, wouldn't you? Mm, yeah. So you never know. I'd say be careful. It works both ways. I'm not going to say very much because we have a very... Um, a uh, packed evening of, of lovely activities. So I'm going to hand over to the Deputy Mayor, uh, Robert Power, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Lucina, and good evening, everyone. Um, I suppose first I have to start by being honest uh, and say that I was probably a little bit late here. And if I've delayed the event, I apologize. But, but the reason for that, and, I, and I, I say this because if there's any, any room that might be sympathetic to this excuse is that I was reading a bedtime story and I was slightly, slightly delayed, so apologies for that. Um, but I'm delighted to welcome you all here uh, to launch the ninth Kildare Readers Festival programme, which shines a light on the best of literature, books, and words. And it's a, I think it's a fantastic thing that we should celebrate something as humble as the written word. I must admit, I always considered myself uh, a bad reader. Not, that, not to say that I had any trouble reading, but more that I never put aside time for it. Until about three years ago. And three years ago, um, Robert Caro's biography of Robert Moses was released for the first, or published for the first time this side of the Atlantic, 41 years after its initial publication in the US. Now, today the book is acknowledged as, as one of the top 100 non-fiction books of all time. But to me, it will always be the book that rekindled my love of reading and made reading a part of my day to day. And that love of reading is something that is inherent in all of us. In the words of Harper Lee, until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read. One does not love breathing. So I'm personally honored to be here today to open this uh, Reader's Festival. And what a great lineup of events we have here scheduled. Uh, there's place within this program for supporting the emerging writer, creating a platform to share new writings, ideas, and ways of working and communicating. Because the very way in which we communicate with words has changed. Tomorrow, some of you may know, is International Podcast Day, uh, and I'm delighted to see that I think on Saturday week, on the, on the 13th, there's a live podcast from the author of Mother Folklore in the program. So try saying that 10 times fast. <laughs> there's place within this program to acknowledge the contribution of significant writers, as we are doing this evening, uh, here to celebrate the work of Desmond Egan, but more of that in a moment. There's place within this program to find out something new or to remind ourselves of what is important. Uh, and I know Deputy O'Loughlin is here and she's taking part later in the week in the shadow of Queen Maeve uh, discussing the 100th anniversary of the 1918 election and women's suffrage uh, this year, which is a great example uh, of that. 
There's place within this programme as well to showcase what Kildare County Council do, including the Writer in Residence initiative with Maynooth University. And we look forward to welcoming this year's Writers in Residence, uh, Paul Lynch and Chris Doulis Macris uh, to the festival. And there is a place within this programme to feed our curiosity. Uh, getting inside the mind of the authors and thinkers. I know that the 10 Books You Should Read event is one of the most popular of the festival, uh, giving us an opportunity to rummage across other people's bookshelves. And the festival, I suppose, can be considered a reward for the many loyal users of Kildare Library Services, our borrowers and our book club members, and an encouragement to new readers to get involved and to rediscover the joy of books. I'd like to warmly congratulate uh, Marion Higgins, she's here somewhere, we met her on the way in, uh, and her team for pulling together this vibrant programme taking place in the coming weeks here in the Riverbank and in libraries throughout the county. I'd like to extend a particular thanks to Amy Quigley, who is a fairly recent recruit to the Kildare Library Services uh, and has been coordinating the programme this year. I think Marion and Amy and the whole library and arts section within Kildare County Council deserve every praise for their continued success of this festival, but also for their efforts throughout the year, and I think they deserve a round of applause for that. <laughs> but getting back to this evening, we're here to mark the contribution of Desmond Egan. Uh, he's made to, uh, sorry, the, and, and that contribution that he has made to the artistic and cultural landscape of this county his adopted home of County Kildare. Tonight's event is titled Athlone's Sweet New York Sweeter, and no doubt we will hear more about Des's origins in Athlone, but having seen New York Des through the eyes of Robert Caro, I think you'll have your work cut out in convincing me that it's sweeter. I had the honour um, a few months ago of officially opening the uh, Jared Manley Hopkins Summer School. Um, this year, uh, I can tell you that the, the atmosphere was, was remarkable. For me, it was my, my first attendance at the event, and I thought it was something remarkable. People were genuinely excited to be there, to share their love of poetry, and to rekindle long-standing friendships. Participants had come from all around the globe, uh, and with the highest of respects to the organizing committee, it's the efforts of one man over three decades that sustains those friendships, that interest, and that grow for the work of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Every year in July, the Manley Hopkins Summer School brings poetry, visual arts, philosophy, and ecology right to our doorstep. Its longevity is a testament to Des's passion and commitment, and for that we owe him our thanks. He's actually written a poem or two himself. In fact, Des has a wide range of poetry and prose publications, as well as translations, bringing the work to many foreign places. To date, he has published 23 collections of poetry, two of prose and two translations of Greek, pro of Greek plays. His poem, Peace, was adopted as part of a celebration of peace for the millennium, and it was translated into 35 languages. As another New York writer, J.D. Salinger, once said, what really knocks me out is a book that, when you're done reading it, you wish the author that wrote it was a terrific friend of yours, and you could call him up on the phone whenever you felt like it, and that doesn't happen much. But that's exactly what this festival is about. Author and reader sitting down together, celebrating and understanding the thoughts and the processes behind their works and the life experiences that bore that work. Breaking the bread of words with someone passing, just that. What a marvelous occasion and I'm honored to be here tonight. And again, I wish everyone involved in the coming weeks every success. Thank you.
Dave Redmond on bass, Kevin Brady on drums, and Phil on piano. Um, um, Lucina asked me how long is this going to take, or how long will it last? And um, I said, well, it won't be like a Ken Dodd show. My brother went to see Ken Dodd but, but three years ago. He was still in his 80s at the time. So he started at 8 o'clock. And the first interval was at half ten. <laughs> and the interval was for a half an hour. And it finished at 1 a.m. And all his shows were like that. Uh, it, 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 it won't be like that. OK, the question is, why jazz? Well, we know that Des loves Irish traditional music. But he also loves jazz. And I wanted to try and explore the reason why what jazz has done for him and what he has done for jazz. So um, without further ado, we'll just have couple of poems, then some chat, music, a couple of poems, some chat. Um, Lorcan Cranage. <laughs> Athlone. Question mark. As from a garden of original grace and sin, something of twisty lanes, of oblique streets, of voices calm as the landscape. A walk, a spiritual accent lingers in fingerprints everywhere. Makes me persist an interviewer of sorts, dogged with simple questions. My earphones squeaking, cop yourself on, because all art contains an element of the ridiculous. Still. Elbows on the shiny stone. My soul, without ambition, keeps trying to open a door on a street or two. The light, the footsteps, the brief voices that pull at our amniotic fluids, that fix our horoscopes more than any stars. And while the town that is only my town flows by with its river rhythms, shimmery, so slow and dignified with lives, I will glide like a crow up the narrow, casual ways, up through shop doors and windows, the many stories of an idea shared like a zodiac, by faces that turn like gables, by friends, by neighbours, by sing-songs from pubs curling out in smoke, uphill towards my own home. Born, bred, and reared inside me, it tolls more slowly now, turning all into afternoons, with something of that sad echo of the barrack chimes bringing together in quiet, as if everything were waiting. Sweet shops, people, roads, the battery hills of the past, my Connacht Street. Angelus of the small place we discover 
has left us exile everywhere else. Someone waves from the front door and turns back in. Goodbye, old Fiat. My 127 that had to be towed in with your rust eczema flaring through the blue and your leak puddles each side of the floor, your driver's seat with a small tear over a spring, your steering wheel that developed a split, oh, and the visor that slowly comes down as one drives, your gears of mud, your engine with the rattle which turned mechanics' heads quicker than a nice girl. Along with the flotsam in the back window, I left enough of myself in you, even a stranger will find money, probably under the seat, and an ashtray of cigarillo relics I never wanted to empty. Pardon me for forgetting your number. Is it possible I won't sit in you anymore? and watched through your windscreen my river world, trying to squeeze words out of half hours. No, nor, come to think of it, drive you in that thickening silence of a row, nor meet you-know-who at the station, while you sit in the background, like the future, nor park you outside town pubs, city pubs, nor steam in late to school in you the morning after, taking chances belting it across the curra, nor forget you on summer days at lovely spots, knock all and hill, moon, the burn in spring, nor curse dangerous and lady drivers wildly to you, nor push you on one leg downhill, chucking at starting, nor abandon you to the garage like a delinquent, nor scrape your glass clear of the frost on winter Mondays. No more will I dump typewriter, coat, case, books, letters on top of everything else in your back seat. I will never be sad, delighted, hopeful, annoyed, browned off, thoughtful again inside you who loitered in the background of my life bringing together, like a symbol, those last few so suddenly finished years, years now shaped as definitely as your body. And I wonder, will your next driver, discovering odds and ends, realize he has bought a haunted car? Um, Des Athlone question mark. Why the question mark? I mean, that's. Well, uh, I think it'll be arrogant to assume that my experience of a town, I was bred, born, and reared there, but I think it'll be arrogant to assume that I was the last word on it. Uh, and secondly, a genuine Athlone person never professes to be certain about anything. And are you certain of anything? Um, I'm glad you asked me that question. <clears throat> I'm waiting for an answer. <laughs> Am I certain about anything? Uh, it's like being asked the meaning of life. Uh, you know, uh, a famous painter was one time asked, you know, what's, what's the answer? What's, what's the answer to the, the whole uh, question, yeah. the meaning of life? And he said, uh, it was Marcel Duchamp, and he said, there is no answer because there is no problem. I don't know what to say about that. Anyway, I, I think there are lots of problems. Anyway, listen, 
poetry, did you start writing as a young lad or was it when you were in school? You went to St. Finian's. When did you start writing poetry? Well, my mother was a national teacher. I learned to read at the age of three and a half. I sometimes think I had done all my serious reading by the time I was 12. Um, books were always my scene, uh, what I was most interested in. And I, I, I was always playing around with words. When I went to college, I did write a little bit, but it was a GAA college, and one had to keep quiet about such proclivities. Um, and it was only later, after I'd finished an MA exam, that it struck me that this is something I should give a bit more time to. And Patrick Kavanagh said, you dabble with words, and then you discover that it's your life. Uh, so it was with me. So, okay, but so what <coughs> poets or what poems then, when you were young, Gossoon grabbed you? Well, I suppose uh, Yeats was a big yeah. mountain yeah. there. It took me a long time to get out from under his shadow. All great writers leave a, a shadow that you, one that the next generation has to escape from. And one of the things that helped me to move on and, and not be writing sub Yeatsy and stuff was um, going to the States to hear the, the jazz music. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't go back from the uh, activity and the violence and the uh, spontaneity and the nowness of what was happening in New York. You couldn't go back from that and start writing about flowers in a vase. OK, well, well, I think we're jumping ahead here a little bit. We'll come to that in a second. But what was it? Um, did, what, what was your first poem to be published? Um, the first uh, poem to be published was published in Agenda. Okay. It's an English poetry sure. magazine. Yeah. And uh, the, the title of it, it's in one of these uh, books. It yeah. was... Um, uh, Thucydides and Lacoul. Okay. And um, <coughs> what was the reaction in Athlone if, uh, if writing was a, a forbidden activity? Well, it was never forbidden in my house. Okay. Uh, my parents were always supportive and, and uh, didn't try to guide me away from this disastrous path. Um, and I might say that I got more of a kick out of that First, the first poem. poem than I have since out of publishing books. Well, you've published sort of about 26 <coughs> books of poems, and I think your, your, your last book is probably the best. I mean, it takes a long time to get it right. I'm still trying to get still it right. Still trying to get it right. Yeah. Look at this photograph here. That's the station, the, yeah. old, the old station. <coughs> Do you have any memories of getting on trains there? And yeah, um, uh, that's not that far from our house. Yeah. And straight opposite the station there would be Gentex, yeah. where the Lenehans, um, Mary O'Rourke being yeah. one of them, came yeah. from. Yeah, um, yeah I, was, I was down there. But these were in the days when one drove a car. My it father was, had a car for a hire, car. and we yeah. always had a car. So, so that was the station as it was, mm. and that's the station as it is today. And now, the, the station as it was was on the Connacht side of town, yeah. and this one is on the Leinster side. And there was a huge um, difference, amazing difference between the people of one side and the other, so we thought. Um, divided I, by the Shannon. Divided by the Shannon. Yeah. It was Leinster on one side, really, and Connacht on okay. the other side. Sure. And uh, I remember the first time I went across the bridge going to the brother's school, because I was very young leaving national school, um, I had more of a feeling of going into another country yeah. than I've had since actually <laughs> going into another country. <laughs> and did you show, did you have to show your passport? Uh, to show my mental passport. Um, do you have any memories of Marketplace? Yeah, um, the, 
on Saturdays, yeah. there'd be an open market there, yeah, yeah. and you'd get a cheap John yeah. um, with his patter and his humour. Uh, many memories of that. The, 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 did you ever have public readings when you when you were a young lad in Athlone? No. No. Okay. So again, it was a kind of a bit of a secret, was it? Well, I did. I got advice from Thomas Kinsler one time, yeah. which is when you've written something, put it away for at least six months okay. and see the next time you look at it if, it, if it's even tolerable. Okay. And uh, I think many people rush into print too, too quickly sure. Sure. and regret it later. Connacht Street, that was... Why is it was this? on the Connacht side of the Shannon. Okay. Um, and when the Williamite forces came down, uh, they were on the Leinster side and they had to try and get across the bridge which was defended by Patrick Sarsfield yeah. and Company 1690. And um, That's the friary on the Leinster side. On the Leinster side. So <coughs> which church did you go to? The other, the big one. Oh, they went to the big one. The one on the Connex side. So, so you, were, you weren't prepared to cross <laughs> that? Occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. right. That's John Broderick. John Broderick. Yeah. Um, he's not often <coughs> mentioned anymore because he sort of was fashionable at a time, but you knew him, didn't you? We were very close friends yeah. for a few years. Yeah. Quite a few years. Yeah. Um, and Broderick's I, bakery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they had the biggest bakery in the Midlands. Yeah. Their vans used to go around. Yeah. And there was a saying. Broderick's bread would kill you dead, especially a man with a curly head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you were that famous. <laughs> um, but uh, for people who don't remember, uh, John Broderick was a novelist and a, a critic. And uh, did he, um, he was he self, he was self-financed, wasn't he? he yeah, they were yeah. very well off yeah. uh, because uh, yeah. the biggest bakery in the Midlands. Yeah. What do you think of his of his work? I think it's dated. It's dated, <coughs> okay. Unfortunately. Yeah. And of course, um, um, John McCormick, John McCormick's house. You, your father knew him. He drove him. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there was one big trip that he took. Um, my father drove him once. We had a car for hire. <coughs> And he drove him once along with Sean McKeown and Archbishop Curley uh, to a concert that he gave down in Sligo. Yeah. And his memory of McCormack uh, in that trip was that he, he spoke in a whisper. He wanted to Service preserve voice. his voice. Service voice, yeah. And here we have, um, it's not your old Fiat, but it, it is no, an old Fiat. It looks much better than mine. Oh, does it? Okay. <laughs> and uh, was that when you were teaching in Newbridge? Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, um, so you were teaching in Newbridge, and um, how long did you spend as a teacher? I, I was there, I think, about 14 years. For 14 years. I, I gave it up in 1987, yeah. when the writing kind of took over took, okay. my life. I just walked out to nothing. I yeah. had nothing. Sure. Well, um, this man here... Um, Looks like Orson Welles. It's Orson Welles, yeah. So th there's a piece in, in, um, uh, in Frank Brady's biography of Orson Welles. I thought I'd read it because it references Athlone. Um, in 1931, Orson Welles came to Ireland. He was 16 years of age. He landed in Galway and spent some time on the Aran Islands. And when he left there... On page 23 of Frank Brady's biography, it states, he took a two-week barge trip up the Shannon from Limerick to the ancient city of Athlone, and then a six-hour bus ride into Dublin. Sitting in the bus, Orson composed a letter to his friend Roger Hill, in which he told an amusing story of espying two young people making love in a trench outside Athlone while their dowager chaperone pretended to be asleep nearby. Although she opened her eyes and winked at Orson when he passed by. So you don't remember that, do you? No, I wasn't there. I wasn't there and it wasn't me. 
I wasn't, um, even, I wasn't even born. You weren't even born. And, and you don't know who the Dowager was? No, but his, his memory of Athlone reminds me of something that Patrick Kavanagh's brother, with whom I was very friendly, Peter Kavanagh, yes. he said you, you wrote a couple of books about Athlone. Yeah. He said I was going to the west of Ireland and I was going through Athlone on the train yeah. and I, I looked out to see this uh, famous place. What a dump. <laughs> anyway. He was he, wrong, of course. He was wrong, of course. So um, after becoming a full-time writer, then you started writing about Northern Ireland and other, 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 other things. OK, we will, we'll go back to the bias. OK. Yeah. Hello, we'll The Northern Ireland question. Two wee girls were playing TIG near a car. How many counties would you say are worth their scattered fingers? Hiroshima. Hiroshima, your shadow burns into the granite of history. Preserves for us pilgrims a wide, serious space where one may weep in silence. I carry in my mind a glass bullet lodged deep the memory of that epicenter where 100,000 souls fused at an instant. And the picture of a soldier tenderly offering a cup of water to a burnt child who cannot respond. The delicate paper cranes. Crows are clamoring on the low roof. Crows are clamoring on the low roof of everywhere I live. And room by room, my cottage falls empty of you. I know you're on a train someplace else, blurring between destinations. The fingers of thought balancing your face. I know you're figuring me out again. That's judgment, tender, cruel as youth, making me become now a burglar even in my own house, so that everything begins to scream its otherness and the night barks. Barks. Mignon, my only hope. Come flooding in with lights, the normal sounds, the voice which says, it's all right. And that very breath, the strangeness, just as the music starts.
meeting Thelonious. He played, as expected, in a hat. Black hands splayed, beating his own sound from the piano as if nothing else mattered. As if death were plucking the bass, driving the drums, and Monk had to get it all into the only music. To which, at one stage, he rose and shuffled in another direction, and something began to take shape before our very ears. Something so true it made irrelevant our applause, which was barely acknowledged. Something which has stayed real enough to sustain me down the years with its weird beauty. And almost as much as his playing, swaying, bending into the mood, I admired his hesitations, the crises he was true enough to reach, those beyond technique or its rhetoric. Not at all unlike Morandi, faltering in the presence of a bottle. Ending the set, a Chicago shrug said, that's about my best for the moment. And off he walked. But the session had left its aftersound. Something had happened. There was the kind of quiet you get just after the rain stops, when nature seems to brood. A statement of sorts, a shape, a sense of things. I brought it with me down the palazzo steps. <laughs> and it still insisted, with the Coke and paper cup left there on the empty stage, when I returned next day to Morandi. In memoriam, Bill Evans. His reaching piano fingers his paleness, the glasses, the submissive listening head will sink no more into chords. He has slipped out on smiling through the drinks, the night talk, the barmaids, before the end of his final set at 51 to die. The group plays on, and already his records sound older, fraught as last wishes. Waltz for Debbie? Or words remembered from anyone's life, if we had the ear? Is that what his knuckles were straining to reach? The only notes which might be? Afterwards, he nodded kindly as Nellie and I talked a little at the exit, turned to me, mumbled about a few who cared repeated it, and waited for the word I still haven't got. Wonders, where are you? Um, Mr. Monk, um, feel, when did this interest in jazz happen? Um, uh, um, was it in Athlone? Was it in Newbridge? Where was it? Um, probably happened when I was in university. Okay. I read a book on the thing. Um, I was always very interested in music. My mother was from Kilbegan and she said, outside of Kilbegan, she said there was never a night of the week when she was growing up, but there would be traditional Irish music played in the house um, and I, I, I think I have something of that music in me and my first cousin is a professional accordion player made many CDs and the music was always part of me I think if I were to come back again not that I want to once was enough but if I were to it might be as a musician as a musician and um, so, but what particularly um, about jazz? I mean, it, it, was, it was kind of seen as a kind of the music of, 
of drug taking and immoral behavior and uh, excitement and hidden things. I mean, what attracted you to that? The actual music. Um, not <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Des. I know, I know it sounds Come strange. On, Des. I know it sounds strange. Um, no, what I loved about it was the spontaneity of it, the risk. Ah, the and, risk, yeah. And the risk, and also, also the feeling. The feeling, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, um, and, but, okay, so traditionalized music, and then there's jazz, and then, but what made you want to go to New York? I mean, that, that's an incredible thing. I mean, most people would want to go to New York just to um, just to see New York and to see some movies and so on, but to go to jazz clubs—I mean, that's a very unusual, a very unusual thing. There's there's a Pearl Bill Evans, okay, and there's actually there's you and Bill Evans and uh, who's that Eddie Gomez? Eddie Gomez. Yeah. Eddie Gomez, the bass player, was he? Yeah. Okay, so there's you, a young young lad, and full of hope. And, but but and, but you're right in with you're right in with these these, these guys talking to yeah. Bill Evans. Yeah. I mean, who, 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 did he say? Did he ask you who you were? Did he say, "Are you a drummer"? Um, they all asked me. I, I met more many of the big names. Yeah. They all asked me, "Was I a musician?" Okay. Um, and that that you, particular night. That particular night, yeah. Uh, Eddie Gomez gave me a lift home. He gave you a lift home. That that was in uh, Newark. And it was 10 days after, you may, some of you may remember, the Newark riots. Okay. Because he was playing in a jazz club, okay. I went out. Okay. And I found I was the only white person in, in, the, the, club. in the club. And, and how did you get so friendly with Eddie that he'd offer you a lift home? Well, I, I suppose I was showing interest in, in the music, okay. in what he was playing. Yeah, he, he, he didn't think you were a mother or anything, did he? No, he I hope not. Okay. <laughs> um, so... Jazz, but, the, but your other uh, great um, hero is um, um, Charlie Boy Parker. Yeah. And um, you never met him, did you? Know? No, he, was, he, he died uh, before he I died before uh, got there. a chance to hear him. He died in the, when, the f 50 years, was it? Well, he died in the 50s. And poor <laughs> old um, Bill Evans, dying at 51. And um, a lot of jazz great jazz players died. Of course, coming on to classic, classical guys, there's um, Schubert. Schubert, yeah. Um, how, old, how old was Schubert? He was in his, twi I think he was 30, 30, 31. 31. Yeah. And um, what, what happened to him? Uh, I, there are various theories are various as theories, to why he okay. died. There's a theory that he had syphilis and so on. Impossible. The bell of... Bella Bartok, Bella Bartok okay. yeah. So all of the, the these are the, the, the classical composers you moved on to. Of course, jazz and classical music are very, are very closely allied, aren't they? And um, I think the soul of music is the same in... In everything. In, in any real music. There's okay. a lot of fake music around, okay. but in real okay. music, there's not much difference. That's the, Satie on the right. There's, there's, uh, okay. So all of these, these composers are referenced in the, the next section of uh, Satie and... Uh, Richard Strauss. Richard Strauss. And um, this man here, you, he's over, you have him over nearly every summer now, don't you? We've become, he's become one of my closest friends. He's Hans Paulsen. Hans Paulsen. He's the greatest uh, pianist in Sweden and one of the great world pianists. Yeah. And, but what is so great about him? He goes down into the music. Yeah. He gives it everything. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be there when somebody uh, plays with such genuine intensity. He doesn't smile. He doesn't talk to, during a performance. He doesn't grin at the audience. He doesn't try to conduct an orchestra at the same time. He just tries to get right down into the heart of the music. And for me, he always does. I would say he has changed my life. I see. Mm. And, but he, he stays with you when he comes to play, doesn't yeah. he? Now, when he's staying with you, is he, is he practicing all the time? All, he, he practiced for seven or eight hours. Every day? Yeah. Okay. Before, before the concert. 
and on the day of the concert he wouldn't eat yeah. anything, drink coffee. Yeah, just drinking coffee? Yeah. And afterwards? Uh, maybe uh, be slightly different. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, John McCormick there. Um, what was that piece that you did? You, you said that it's, it's your favourite? It is Il Mio Tesoro. Okay. <clears throat> it's, his singing of it is taken to be miraculous. Yeah. Uh, his breathing, uh, the, the legato line that he yeah. has is yeah. just an amazing... Yeah. Uh, you would rarely use the word perfect sure, yeah. of singing, but yeah. it has been used of his singing of Il Mio Tesoro. Yeah. Um, okay, let's... Um, we'll, 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 let, we'll, let, we'll let the... Yeah. The lads, um,
microcosmos. Lean Bartok of that doubting, almost Irish look. Give me, old friend, your broken chords, your uneasy intervals before most symphonies. Or Satie's wit, its whisper of melancholia more touching than grander music. Richard Strauss often rings me. I'm not taken in by that calm voice of his, play mourning at my funeral. When I hear Schubert, he's not wearing glasses. Outside Schubert's last apartment. Watching for the clues a city offers, I taxied through mourning in Vienna to his brother's house in Kettenbruckengasse, where Schubert died. Dropped outside it, alone again, I made my way in and up the 18th century steps holding the handrail he must have held, wondering if melody flies freest of whatever time is. Until pop, noise down the corridor, pursued me along the third floor and its central shaft, its old assumptions to the plastic wreath and a notice, C-L-O-S-E-D. It could nearly have been Dublin. Here he spent his last months. In there he composed the quintet, tearing himself away from us, from his yearning for what passes, his goodbye. As if he already were the other side of the sad shadows, the 31 years, the few moments turning into a lifetime before typhoid chopped it off. Here. I climbed on a ledge to catch a glimpse, 1828. It's dusk and flooring, the pathos of a desk, dead corners, wallpaper, and further in, a room of blinds, a long, narrow forte piano, a rosewood coffin at a wake turned into stillness, into pure silence. Houses stay longer than people, and even genius needs its brief roof. My pilgrimage took an age. I even sat a while below in the cloister where the tree grew. The pump with the dog's head spout and the wattled roofs the high, unreachable sky. They came with me when I drew the heavy door closed on him. And that look, he never tried to explain. Listening to John McCormick. Like anything human, music has body as well as soul. So listening to him singing, I hear not only the pure lyric note, that note, but with the exile's ear, I can also find our shared Athlone, a flash of the Shannon down Friary Hill, the streets, the Midland spires, the faces, the narrow laneways into the heart, and feel his live words cutting through the tragic gloom of what is past. Recover briefly my parents this side of history. My mother, sitting in a boat to her island schoolhouse across the morning of Loch Ree. Or my father in his thirties cap, arm, I know it, out the window as he drives. McCormack himself, going whispering to his concert with Archbishop Curley and the blacksmith of Balnalee. It strikes like light along the river, below the Matthew Hall, the old promenade, where his bronze looks homeward.
I think I think one of the things that um, is is very important um, is that poets write poetry, and unless you're Seamus Heaney, um, unless you get that weight of publicity behind you, the general public don't really know about them. So this evening is an attempt to um, try to alert you to poetry that, that um, is a little bit different, but yet is very accessible. And it's, it's connected with things that we, we all sort of know. But I want to ask you now about your, some of your favorite poets, your favorite Irish poets and American poets and different poets. Um, well, Irish writing in English, Patrick Kavanagh. Patrick Kavanagh, sure. I think yeah. he's one of the great He's Irish, one of the great poets. One of the great. Uh, was, was he an early influence, he was? Um, Probably was. I'm yeah. not aware of it. But and, and of course, through his brother Peter, you were, yeah. you were heavily involved in publishing yeah. most yeah. of his stuff. And in getting the, the manuscripts over to Ireland. Yeah. How that came about was I was walking with Peter one day and I said, you know, those manuscripts, they were in a little wooden shack down uh, near, down south of New York yeah. by the sea. And I said, you know, you should get those over to Ireland and not sell them to one of the big American uh, universities. Yeah. And Peter s said, maybe you're right. Um, I think the University of Texas was interested at the time. Yeah. He said, but what would they be worth? And I still remember we were both walking down 3rd Avenue. We stopped for a minute. And I have a very clear memory of looking up at the skyscrapers and I said to him, they'd be worth 100,000. And that's how the price was set. Yeah. And, and, um, and they came over. They came over here, mm. they did, yeah. Um, Michael Hartnett? Uh, I was very friendly with Michael. He, he wasn't an influence. Um, but I was very friendly with him. I, I think I was, I was the last person to see him alive the, when he was in hospital up in yeah. St. Vincent's. Yeah. He sent word the night before that he'd like... Yeah. To see me, I went up the following morning, and he had a mask on his face. He he, he tried to take it off yeah. to to talk, yeah. and uh, I remember saying to him, "Michael, I've seen you looking better." Yeah. Um, and I, I spoke to him for a while, and yeah. I gave him a hug. Yeah. And as I was getting into the car, the news was on the radio that he had died. Quite. Uh Quite a sad, dramatic end. Um, he had the beautiful lyric voice. He had, yeah. This man, Kinsler, Thomas Kinsler. Very, very different. Um, very cerebral. Yeah. But you always feel there's something at stake. There's a kind of intensity about his writing, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also his use of language. I remember going to. New York and bringing Nightwalker with me, with yeah, me, yeah. because uh, the the use of language in it I found inspiring. Yeah, I, I like Kinsel and friendly with him. The um, I'm going to ask the audience in a few minutes uh, if they've got any any questions to up there, because I'm sure we've got some questions to ask him. And um, but but before we do, I just want to. So you published Des. 26 books of verse, countless books of prose. You've won numerous awards from universities and institutes all over the world. Books have been translated into Chinese, French, Italian, Spanish, German, Swedish, Hungarian, Romanian, Russian, Greek, and Japanese. And next Wednesday, you fly to Zagreb for the launch of your book, Elegies and Other Poems, which has been translated into Serbo-Croat. So does where has it all gone wrong? <laughs> you tell me. I don't know. I mean, where, where has it all gone wrong? Can anybody in the audience, uh, has anybody got a question? Well, I, I say this. I was never interested in, in publicity, and I still yeah. am not. Yeah. You have to work on it, and I couldn't be bothered. Um, and but, but, I, but, I was but, reading... but, but, but you've got to get people to read your work. 
Um, well, I've got to get the work done. Well, you've, got, you've got 26 books out uh, there. Well, that's where I put my energy. Okay. And I don't have much left for, for grinning at critics or reporters or whatever. I came across a quotation from reading um, uh, Beethoven's letters recently to bring a tear from a stone. Okay. This is the quotation, uh, Beethoven. I have never dreamed of writing for fame and honour. What weighs on my heart must come out, and that's why I have written. Okay, well, that's a good, that's a good explanation. Uh, has anybody got a, got a question? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, oh, somebody. I'm just curious, Jez, about you know, the way, um, kind of way poetry is going, and there, there's a sort of increasing recognition of uh, poetry as a vocal art, and, and, and also people making connections with rap music, uh, people like Eminem. I think uh, Seamus Heaney regarded Eminem as his work as being of poetic value, and, and then we had uh, Bob Dylan winning the, uh, the Nobel Prize. I'm just wondering what your view is of those kind of developments. Do you see them in the same light as uh, more literary figures like yourself? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think giving Bob Dylan the Nobel Prize was a disgrace. <clears throat> what about Leonard Cohen? I was just reading um, in a book review this very day yeah. some of... Uh, Leonard Cohen began as a poet. Yeah. And I th like some of his early stuff with, with somebody gone, with somebody gone whose eyes to compare with the morning sun. You know that one? Yeah. That was a nice short poem. But the, qu the, the poems that were quoted in the review I read in today's uh, Observer... Uh, Gargin, Gargin. Um, it was awful stuff. If I wrote it, I'd be torn limb from limb. Um, the other person who was a great, a great writer and a, an artist, <coughs> James, James McKenna. McKenna was my closest friend. Um, he was a great writer, a great, complete artist. He gave everything to his art and suffered for it. He lived on bread and jam for 30 years. Uh, he never had money, he never cared about it. He was totally uncompromising. We all learned to compromise in small things. James couldn't even compromise in small things. And so he was constantly getting into uh, rows and so on. But he was a marvelous spirit, uh, one, one of the most important Irish artists in the last hundred years, I would say. Yeah. The, um, I, 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 somebody asked me, what was I doing? So I'm do, doing this this evening with um, with uh, Des He said, oh, Des is very prickly. He's got more what? prickles than a hedgehog. <laughs> is that true, Des? <laughs> no, as you can see, it's not it's completely <laughs> not, not true. I, there, I think there, I need some prickles here. I need some prickles. There's, there's such a thing as... I came across the expression in that book on, on Beethoven as an artist's spleen. Yeah. If you're interested in standards and if you commit yourself and your life to trying to achieve standards, yeah. it makes you a little bit uh, tetchy uh, when these are seen to be interfered with in other directions. Okay. So would you like to just finish off um, um, uh, with, with peace? Okay. And then we, we, we'll follow that with a with, um, with, uh, composition, new composition that Phil has um, put together. Okay. Should I? You, you, you go up to the... Up to the will, that, yeah. will that interfere with this? <laughs> will it, Peter? No. No, it won't. No, you're fine. Peace. Just to go for a walk out the road. Just that. Under the deep trees which whisper of peace. 
to break the bread of words with someone passing. Just that, four of us round a pram and baby fingers asleep. Just to join the harmony, the fields, the blue everyday hills, the puddles of daylight, and you might hear a pheasant echo through the woods, or plover may waver by as the evening poises with a blackbird on its table of hedge. Just that, here and there, a gate, a bungalow's bright window, the smell of wood smoke, of lives. Just that. But sweet Christ, that is more than most of mankind can afford, with the globe still plaited in its own crown of thorns. Too many starving eyes, too many ancient children squatting among flies, too many stockpiles of fear, too many dog jails, too many generals, too many under torture by the impotent screaming into the air we breathe. Too many dreams stuck in money jams. Too many mountains of butter selfishness. Too many poor drowning in the streets. Too many shanty towns on the outskirts of life. Too many of us not sure what we want, so that we try to feed a habit for everything until the ego puppets, the militaries, mirror our own warring face. Too little peace.
I wanted, I wanted to thank the, the Philbar Trio, Lorcan Cranage, um, Lucina Russell, Kildare Arts Service, Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, TD, but and particularly uh, the man with all the prickles, Desi again. <laughs> <laughs>